distinguished guests, participants of the MCC Summit, professionals who have all honored us with their presence today. It is my great pleasure to invite you all for the last panel discussion of this three-day conference, to be honest. And as we have arrived at the concluding panel, we also have to think about the transition in a war period. Now we're talking about green transition, not political transition. And for this final discussion, I would like to welcome the moderator, Gergely Kitta, Head of Strategy and Communication at the Climate Policy Institute. So for the final time, please give a warm round of applause for the participants of the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. It is a really a great pleasure to see that uh, a lot of people stay here uh, after the lunch. So, you know, it's uh, telling the truth is it's uh, always challenging to enduring to the end of a two day conference and heading to the last panel discussion in a gloomy Saturday afternoon. So thank you very much again for your attention and your focus on this uh, topic. I really appreciate it. Uh, I, I just use the word uh, gloomy, uh, not by accident, by, but by deliberately, because if you check out the weather outside, it's, it's cloudy. Uh, and uh, it's not normal uh, in Budapest, in Hungary, that, that uh, it has been raining for, for two days. And in this period of the uh, season, we have a very, very harsh and gloomy and wet, wet uh, uh, weather and, and, and nasty circumstances. And I'm, uh, I'm mentioning this, this weather situation because I want to draw a parallel with, in a symbolic way, uh, uh, with the situation in, in Europe. So dark, thick uh, clouds coming up over the European economy and society as well. And uh, it's not normal either. And uh, that harsh situation can, can uh, hinder uh, the process of green transition, uh, which is going to be the topic of today. But before jumping into the forthcoming uh, conversation on this, this uh, issue, uh, I have the pleasure to introduce my highly acclaimed and distinguished uh, guests and, and panelists. First of all, uh, I would like to start with you, uh, Gavin. Dr. Gavin D.G. Harper is a research fellow at Faraday Institution at uh, the University of Birmingham, and you are the author of many uh, fascinating books, mainly on sustainable technology, yeah. but you have other achievements. <laughs> uh, but I stop here. Ne next to uh, him, uh, Ahmed Penny, who is uh, the editor-in-chief of, of Grid Brief, and, and Ahmed uh, is a great guy who came from Chicago uh, to the MCC Summit. Thank you that you are uh, here. And I would like to uh, warmly welcome here uh, Sean Ryordan, former diplomat, and uh, you have a very long title, so I have to check it out. <laughs> Director of the Chair for Diplomacy and Cyberspace European Institute of International uh, Studies. I'm uh, very glad that you uh, are among us. Uh, the fourth panelist of this panel discussion is Stefan Schipka, who is a policy analyst at uh, the European Policy Center based in Belgium. And uh, this is a, uh, an independent uh, uh, think tank, an organization uh, that has its headquarter in, uh, in Brussels. And at last but not least, my dear colleague, I would like to introduce uh, Mr. Mate Litkei, who is the director of the Climate Policy Institute. And this, this institute, this think tank, uh, is operating under the wings of the MCC, within the MCC. So uh, thank you. Okay, then, as I, as I promised, we, we can jump into the uh, question of, of green transition, green transformation. And I know that uh, you are not fortune tellers, but uh, I would like you to make some predictions and some estimations about the future of, of green transition. 
uh, I would like you I would like to test you whether you are optimist or pessimist about the future of uh, green transition because there are many many harsh uh, circumstances around uh, around uh, this uh, uh, topic uh, if I uh, if I have some introductory thoughts that that can um, be fruitful for you to discuss this topic I, I think uh, there are optimists uh, in this topic and optimists uh, think that however painful the crisis is uh, it can accelerate the green transformation uh, just because we are forced to cut ourselves off from the Russian fossil fuels and uh, we will be inclined to to spend more money on uh, re renewable energy production facilities and capacities and uh, we are prone to to invest more money into such cutting edge and, and innovative uh, industries as, as, for example, the battery or, or the hydrogen sec sectors are. Uh, so they are the pessimists, but of course, in, in the evaluation of uh, every case, there are pessimists as well, and pessimists are saying uh, uh, quite the opposite and believe in the quite the opposite. They are saying that, uh, for example, because of the continuous reopening of coal mines or the substitution of uh, pipeline natural gas with LNG, which, which has a greater carbon footprint on the environment, or for example, the, uh, the, the firing of biomass, mainly wood, uh, in greater and greater quantities, uh, can together uh, mean a kind of halt or, or hinder on the process of green transition. Not mentioning that, and this this uh, uh, this problem uh, was mentioned several times during the previous panel discussions. That there is a situation uh, in the uh, in the north that there was a sabotage or an attack against the. Uh, north pipeline one, one or two and there is a great leakage of methane so we can see that we can experience that there are very uh, direct and uh, and uh, negative influences of the war on, on reaching the climate goals so so my my precise question is what's what is going to be the effect of war on economic crisis uh, on green transition according to your opinion will it boost or break the process? Are you optimistic or pessimistic? Gavin, please be the first to answer this question. I'll just get my crystal ball. Um, so I think it's, it's a complex answer. I think we're going to see a differentiated range of different approaches with a whole range of different technologies. But the, the one thing is, in the short term, we're not going to be able to build out alternative supply capacity of any form quick enough to displace um, the, the gas that's been lost. So in the immediate term, it's going to be about demand side management. And that's going to involve changes to people's lifestyles. It's going to involve a bit of constraint. It's going to involve some economic slowdown. But we've seen before with things like previous oil crises, um, how that sort of necessity has driven innovation. And you can look at you know, the introduction of smaller cars, for example, in places like the United States where they don't like small cars, how that has accompanied um, those sort of energy shocks in the past. I think in terms of the green transition, um, we've got this challenge on the one hand, highlighting Europe's energy vulnerability is a real driver for trying to encourage the deployment of more renewables. But we face some challenges because we're in a world that is still recovering from the COVID pandemic, all of the disruption that that caused to various supply chains. We've now got additional challenges with, with, with Russia and, and, and sanctions and, and traders of metals that are squeamish about dealing with, with Russian metal producers. And so we've got a crimp on some of the materials that are able to, to build the technologies that will power this green transition. And of course, a real beneficiary of this is going to be China and other countries that are less squeamish about procuring materials from Russia. So we've got this sort of mixed problem where on the one hand, there's going to be heightened demand, but I think supply will be constrained around renewables and there will be some supply chain challenges there. I think in terms of nuclear power, 
You only have to look at the situation with EDF at the moment, all the challenges that the French have run into with Flamanville, Olicuoto, Hinkley Point, closer to home. Nuclear isn't a solution that's going to deliver um, you know, any new build capacity in a hurry. Some countries may look at things like reactor life extensions and things like that to prolong existing capacity and keep it in service for longer. But I don't think, you know, there's not going to be new capacity that comes on stream. I think there will be some setbacks to the green transition in the respect that obviously out of all of the hydrocarbon fuels, methane is the most hydrogen rich and, and the lowest carbon. And I think in that transition, where that isn't available, we are going to see you know, a temporary switch to some higher carbon forms of fossil fuels to keep the lights on and to keep things running in the in-between time. But I think that's going to be a temporary thing. I think the overall thrust is towards the longer-term transition to decarbonisation. But we need a little bit of pragmatism in the short term. Thank you very much. I would like to proceed in a row. So, Emmett, please, uh, what is your opinion about that? Yeah, I mean, I uh, very much agree with my esteemed colleague here. I think um, one of the issues when we take a look at how we got here at all, I would say, is that um, there has been, I think, a little bit of overpromising about the type of world aggressive renewables build-outs we're going to create. And I think the story uh, to me really is that what we discovered in um, Germany lately is that it is possible to achieve an energy transition away from nuclear and towards coal. Um, and I also think that uh, there seems to be um, perhaps overconfidence, I see this in America as well, uh, about what intermittency does to an electrical grid um, and the problems that it inspires down the line. And one of those problems is that you're always going to need some sort of fuel uh, to back them up. And it works in a, for every one megawatt of installed renewable capacity you have, you need 1.15-ish in backup. And storage isn't really going to do that. And because you need things to come on immediately, natural gas is going to do that. And so I think when we take a look at the energy transition, I would think that we're going to see a setback that we just had described to us here, but that it should also inspire greater prudence about what we do to our industrial systems. And that I think uh, having a regard for base load or traditional thermal generation is going to be a larger part of the story going forward. Not for every country, but I think for many countries. Um, and that I think that this is going to take a lot longer than just 2050 or something beyond that. I think that the energy transition itself as an idea, the idea that we will move from hydrocarbons to minerals to uh, get our energy needs largely through electrification, folding more things into the electricity sector, suffers from what I like to call the propaganda of the Industrial Revolution, where there's a story that's been told that it happened very, very swiftly, maybe only a handful of decades, maybe only a couple or whatever. But if we look at the record, it was more like 200 years to achieve what we had by the end of the 19th century. And I think we should expect long-term horizons like that for this. So that actually makes me optimistic in the long term because I think that the energy transition will happen. And if we look at what's happening now, this looks more like a hiccup than a total crisis for the amount of progress we can make. Thank you. Sean, please say your comments. But before that, <laughs> I would like to make your job uh, a bit more difficult. So uh, we are speaking about long-term and short-term dimensions of, of the grid transition. The European Union has a very uh, concrete and exact uh, date of, of uh, the carbon for the carbon neutrality, 2050. Is it achievable uh, in the present situation, uh, according to uh, according to your view, or, or not? Well, if I can go to your first question first, um, I'm neither an optimist nor a pessimist. I'm an ex-diplomat. 
<laughs> yes, yes. <okay. laughs> uh, and they say diplomats, we are realists. Mm -hmm. And we know that the world it never works the way you want it to. Mm. Um, Henry Kissinger famously said that the tragedy of foreign policy is that all the options are bad ones. All the outcomes are bad, and the art of statecraft is managing things so you get the least bad outcome. And I think that's going to apply to uh, the energy transition as well. Uh, if you ask me about the European Commission's target, no. The European Commission, I'm afraid, fo focuses a little bit like the Soviet bureaucracy in the Soviet Union during the Cold War. Uh, they centralize a lot, they harmonize a lot, they believe they know the answer to everything, and they launch five-year plans, 10-year plans, uh, without really thinking how the plans are. The, the important thing is to have a plan, not how you're going to achieve it. And I, I think it's a, it's a weakness of the European Commission in general. Uh, if we are going to do anything with uh, climate change and changing the, uh, the energy transition, I think we've got to change the way we think about it. At the moment, we think about, oh, well, we can't do anything at the moment, we're in a crisis. But when we get out of the crisis, we'll go back to dealing with it. And that's assuming we're ever going to be out of crisis. Um, most of the, the people of, of my generation, generation below, grew up during a period that sometimes called the Great Convergence, where if you lived in Europe, life was peaceful, life was getting better generation by generation, uh, we didn't have conflict, we didn't need to worry about geopolitics, and certainly once we got past 1991, history had ended, as Fukuyama told us, and we smooth, smoothly progressed up until 2007. And since 2007, we've had a series of crises, and this is not abnormal. We think it's abnormal. Actually, as um, an American historian said, the world's back to normal. This is what the world normally looks like. Crisis after crisis after crisis. So we've now had um, the economic financial crisis, 2007, 2008. We had the sovereign debt crisis, 2012. Uh, we had COVID, 2020, 21. Russian invasion of Ukraine. And we act as if this is abnormal. I promise there will be another crisis next year or the year after. And there will be another crisis. And I can't tell you what they're going to be. We might, we might speculate we're going to have a financial crisis. We might have another pandemic. Uh, China might invade Taiwan. Uh, a, the economy of a major country might collapse. And they will keep happening. So if we want to start thinking about how we're going to do the energy transition, we've got to factor in that broad environment. And we've got to think about how do we do this during crises, not between crises. Mm. And we haven't really even started thinking about that yet. So unless we really change the way we think, and perhaps adopt a little bit of the diplomat's approach, you know, there aren't any good outcomes out there let's try and get the least bad one, then I think we run the, we run the risk of uh, losing the good in pursuit of the best. Thank you. It was a really a, uh, philosophical uh, type of uh, answer. Uh, Stefan, uh, do you have anything to add to this? Thank you. Well, I would, I would say that we really need to, to look at the bigger picture and uh, try to put things into a perspective. Uh, so that we can then address what is going on now and in the next five or ten or s years or more. Uh, so, I mean, whether we are optimist or pessimist doesn't really change the outcome of our inaction. One way or another, we are, we are heading towards a disaster if we don't really change the ways that we, we produce and consume, be it energy, but also uh, material economics uh, and, and, and other, and other uh, uh, parts of our socioeconomic system. Uh, so global warming is an existential crisis. Biodiversity loss is an existential crisis on its own. So we prioritize climate, rightfully so. But biodiversity, for example, is another, I would say, equally important challenge. We just don't have time to, to manage all of this, but uh, it, it, it is. Plus pollution, which is, of course, a problem also. It's linked with other problems, but also have health concerns, economic costs of pollution, waste and depletion of resources that are limited in nature and limited in Europe. And we depend on other markets, especially for an, a couple of countries that also are arguably not really reliable to depend on for certain materials that we need for the green transition, for the digital transformation and so forth. So the thing is that we, and, and, and what, is, what, is, what is a challenge is that uh, uh, we are already experiencing some of the 
the effects of these uh, of these um, mega trends like global warming, like floods and uh, and droughts and so forth. But it will become worse. It gets worse every year. And the thing is that if we don't act now, it is too late. Now the problem is that we tend to prioritize immediate short-term uh, challenges, and we then completely focus on them, and that's understandable. I mean, that's that's what we do. That that that's we prioritize it because we need to act immediately and solve certain particular problems. Mm -hmm. But what we need to become better at is to to be able to you know uh, extinguish these fires when they come up. You know, concrete crisis, and of course the energy crisis and the Russian invasion being the latest one without parallel. But we have a number of crises as outlined by, uh, listed by, by Sean. Uh, we need to become better at dealing with these crises while playing the long game. And it is definitely unacceptable that we, every time a new crisis occurs, that we say, okay, let's deal with the green transition tomorrow. Tomorrow it becomes never. The problem also being that, I mean, just to say also something on the crisis, indeed, like we are having crisis, uh, a new crisis like every two years, basically, and they are multiplying something. Now we have actually the, the effects of COVID plus the energy crisis and the war in Ukraine. So um, the thing is that, and that's what basically at the EPC we call, we term the perma crisis. It's a state where crisis becomes a sort of a normality. I know it's a bit of a contradiction, but we are dealing with the crisis uh, as, as a given, as a normality in a way. The question is, can we end that? And can we minimize the effects and learn to cope better with this crisis? The link with the green transition is that green transition can be uh, an engine, or, or it can drive new crises. So they, as because of the global warming and so forth, it can have direct consequences or indirect consequences because of climate migration, conflicts that can occur in the future and so forth. So if we don't address the, the, these challenges now, uh, we will have new crises, and we can use the green transition to actually help avoid future crises or to cope, to learn to cope better, better with them. Now, more specifically, as to the ongoing crisis, indeed, uh, uh, it, it is a sort of an opportunity to really make systemic changes in our system, but you can't do it immediately. So indeed, it can uh, be an incentive to switch to renewables or to support innovation in this regard, but you can't do miracles or you can't do this kind of replacements immediately uh, and you also have already other alternatives available there which are not preferable of course but you have coal that can be used and it is hinted already the eu hinted in the repower eu plan that we may use coal as well as nuclear more intensively as an alternative at least for the time being because of the the, the shortages we are facing and the problems because of the, the lack of fossil fuels that we are still depending upon. So short term, it's, it is a question. What will be the final score in this regard? In the long run, we need to, to find ways to incentivize this shift towards cleaner energy and, uh, and, and, and also more sustainable ways in which we produce and consume, which is not always impossible. It's also about our lifestyles, the, uh, how we set price incentives, how we develop policy frameworks, where do we put our money, especially public money, how we leverage also, how we use private investments to channelize them towards greener economic activities. You can do a lot, but indeed it requires time, and you need to think long term, you need to involve all the stakeholders uh, earlier on so that they don't, are not shocked and then they don't, uh, that there is no backlash. And uh, indeed, I think it's about that, uh, setting right policies, innovation, and, uh, and also changing the ways in which we produce uh, and consume. So I would like to think of myself as an optimist, but there is no other alternative than to, than to try to, to believe that you can do something because it's not like, uh, you know, it's not like some, some, some trivial thing, you know. It's, it's really like an existential threat if we don't get things right when it comes to our relations to, to our natural resources. Mati? Yes, the, uh, thank you very much, first of all. Uh, the question was originally, can we implement the green transition or not? And uh, in my opinion, uh, it depends on uh, how we uh, define green and how we define transition. And uh, by green, I mean uh, that uh, we would like to provide a more sustainable, more livable uh, future for the next generations. And I believe that no 
no, no one person here would say I, I uh, wouldn't like a more sustainable future for my children or, or grandchildren. So there is a consensus on that question, the social support, and we have the technology uh, to implement that right now, I, I, uh, I think. So innovation is very important, I agree, but uh, we have solutions right now, so we can start this transition. But the transition part is, uh, is uh, more, uh, more, of a cash, more of a question because uh, there are several tools we can choose uh, on this way. And um, one, is the, one is the problems uh, are that uh, uh, in the European Union and in the US, uh, we set an ultimate goal that we would like to uh, improve uh, our environmental, um, 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 you know, uh, things and we would like to provide a more sustainable future for the next generations. That's okay, that's agreeable, uh, agreeable and uh, we can accept that. Uh, but uh, if we uh, set uh, intermediate targets like, uh, for example, the carbon neutrality 2050, it's also acceptable, but how can we uh, implement that? And uh, on the way, uh, these intermediate targets became the ultimate goals. For example, Germany set a target that they would like to produce the electricity 80% from renewables. But right now, we cannot store the electricity. And uh, with the, uh, with the um, increasing of uh, renewable capacities, they had to increase the gas capacities as well because uh, these uh, uh, capacities were the most flexible and they can balance uh, the production uh, with that uh, solution. But, uh, and it wa wasn't a problem in the past, but right now uh, it's a problem. And uh, parallelly with this, uh, we uh, decreased the extraction almost every uh, uh, energy, uh, uh, fossil fuel in the continent, coal, crude oil, gas, and uh, we cannot decrease the consumption uh, parallelly with this. O of course, we uh, decreased uh, some level, but we decreased more the extraction. And uh, with that, we, we create a dependency on other countries. And it wasn't a problem in the past, but right now it is. Uh, so uh, we created the perfect storm, the so-called perfect storm. And uh, it was in the name of the green transition. So I suggest we should uh, supervise the tools we use right now. But the goal is, is right, I think, and we can agree on the goal, the ultimate goal, but the tools, it's questionable. Uh, thank you. Fortunately, uh, you have so many good ideas and we have uh, five uh, precious, highly acclaimed gentlemen in, in, in this panel discussion. For this reason, we, we, we have already consumed 30 minutes, so I, I would like to skip some questions and uh, and touch the the issue of uh, the behaviors and the attitudes of, of government. So we can experience uh, different behaviors and attitudes of government in in reacting uh, the crisis and in building up uh, strategies for tackling uh, the problems of the uh, crisis. Uh, for example, if I want to pick uh, one example, uh, if, you look, uh, if you have a look at on the Germans, the Germans not long ago decided to um, prolong the shutting down of their last two nuclear power uh, plants. I know that this is just a procrastination uh, in all probability, but it can sign a kind of change in the mindset of the Germans. Uh, and uh, in tandem with that, they also uh, uh, prolong the taxation on meat, or for example, the taxation on uh, traditional combustion engines that were previously announced and, uh, or planned. So we can, uh, we can uh, experience a slight change in, in, in the times of crisis uh, in, the, in the thinking of the German politicians. Whereas, for example, in the Netherlands, we can, uh, we can show uh, tremendous demonstra demonstrations and protests 
uh, held by farmers who were very angry about uh, the government and the Ministry of Environment and, and Climate because the gov government in the Netherlands went on closing farms that weren't able to keep uh, the restrictive regulation on nitrogen emission. So uh, my question is that uh, reaching the climate goal uh, should be among the top priorities of, of, uh, of governments or you know there are a hierarchy of problems, there are a hierarchy of goals and uh, in such harsh times you can rearrange those. Gavin. Yes, yeah, so I think uh, in terms of industrial transition and innovation, we are fools unto ourselves if we don't grasp the opportunity because plenty of other countries around the world are starting to see the opportunities that come with the green transition. They've secured access to the supply chains for key critical materials for that transition. They've built the primary processing capacity to transform that raw material into processed goods. And the risk is that if we don't catch up, and we are catching up in Europe with, with, with China and, and other Asian countries, we'll be left with a load of sunset industries, legacy industries, stranded assets, which in the long term will really harm our competitiveness. So I think, you know, from an, from an industrial policy point of view, we need to ensure that we keep investing in innovation. I think perhaps there needs to be some flexibility in how things are implemented given you know, immediate and pressing challenges around energy. But I think we store problems up for the future if we delay the cost of action today. Um, you know, some of the things that are gonna result from climate change, not just in terms of you know, weather effects, increased rate of natural disasters, but things like climate-induced migration um, you know, and the impacts that that is gonna have on economies in the north. So I think we store problems up for ourselves in the future if we don't take action today, even though, you know, there is a war, there's a crisis, there are always, uh, you know, an ongoing series of things that you could use as excuses for inaction. Um, but actually, in, in the grand scheme of things, this is noise. And some of the challenges that we face are much bigger, overarching, and deserve our immediate attention. Ahmed, what is, what is your reflection on that? Yeah, um, I'm not particularly a climate hawk. I think it's important. I think it's something that we need to address. I think uh, valence issues, right? So these are things that just governments need to do in order to keep being the government, um, outrank it. Uh, so I'm far more concerned about things like poverty or keeping the lights on or life in the countries where people get on with less electricity per day than my refrigerator uses, for example. Um, so I think that those are a little bit more pressing as crises. And I also think that um, there are some tricky paradoxes here. Everything that we want to do, uh, because I like what Mate said, we all agree here that you know we might have disagreements on tools, but we all want to get to the same direction. The paradox that we have to deal with here is that Every single thing, more or less, industrially, that anybody on this stage would recommend for the green transition is going to need fossil fuels for their construction, for their maintenance, for whatever. And we might get to a point where we've totally decoupled that. I think if we actually drill down into the supply chains for that, that is an incredibly staggeringly difficult task that will be made more difficult if there is higher cost and more inertia in those domains. And by that I mean if the cost of fossil fuels continues to rise, it will be harder and harder to get these technologies to work for us because everything will be more difficult. And then I think we should also take into perspective um, what's going on in the developing world. So all of America's emissions reductions since 2005, let's say, by the end of this year will be rendered meaningless in the face of the construction of coal power plants in the developing world. So I also think that if we're wondering what the role that government has to play in, sometimes I think we narrowly constrain our view 
to strictly what do we do domestically in the developed world within our own countries and sometimes to our own populations uh, when we might wonder um, how we can partner more successfully with countries that are living in energy poverty that will do whatever they can. This is what my friend Robert Bryce calls the iron law of electricity. People will do whatever they can to keep the lights on or to get the lights turned on. And so I think that is maybe sometimes an even easier role for government to step in because that puts us in intergovernmental diplomacy rather than strict economic management of the nation state or something like that. So that's my answer. Thank you. I'd like to shuffle the cards. So please, it is, uh, Mate, it is you who have to answer the question. <laughs> Okay, so <clears throat> the role of the government, I totally agree with Emmet, uh, to increase or at least uh, maintain the living standards uh, of the people. Uh, this is the <coughs> primary uh, goal of a government. And uh, <coughs> to, to that, uh, uh, it's not, you know, you can choose, for example, to uh, shift to fossil fuels in, the, in this situation uh, and use coal fire power, uh, power plants uh, because it's affordable, more affordable uh, than using gas nowadays. And uh, this will mean, uh, and, uh, at the end of the days, um, uh, more uh, competitive advantage uh, for that country and more jobs and uh, a higher living standards, for example, of the people of this country. Uh, but uh, this will... Um, turn us down uh, from the green transition. So our biggest job, uh, or the government's biggest job, to bring to a common ground these aspects. And uh, to that, I think uh, we should uh, consider three aspects. It's uh, affordability, it's uh, security, and uh, the, the environmental performance. And uh, these three uh, aspects uh, at the same place, at the same time, uh, we have a solution. And the problem is, uh, right now we, for example, subsidize technologies uh, which are not market ready yet. And uh, uh, we, we try to use and uh, we try to build uh, a whole energy system on, on, uh, on uh, those technologies. And uh, I'm not a skeptic, for example, in the question of uh, renewable energies. Uh, they are just not ready yet. Uh, and. Uh, uh, I think, uh, for, okay, I, I see the skeptic face on Gavin, but <coughs> uh, I, I, I will tell you a, a, an example. Uh, for this uh, energy crisis, I, I think uh, this was a, a driver that we uh, have to use more and more gas to, to balance the, the system. And, uh, and uh, we uh, had to buy it from Russia because it was the cheapest way to to uh, have a supply of gas. And right now uh, that we try to cut ourselves from, from Russia, uh, we don't have the gas, and uh, the gas prices um, um, heat the prices of electricity. Uh, and uh, before that point, uh, um, renewable energy uh, was affordable, but right now uh, the production uh, is, is, uh, is a problematic uh, thing. So um, I think uh, if we have a market readiness, if we have an affordability in that sense, that we have a solution as well. Stefan? Well, I would say that governments definitely have a key role to play. Uh, they're not, not only them, but they are important simply because they can use their policies, namely regulation, public investments, but also soft power to encourage the transition to create proper incentives for producers, for consumers, for citizens to actually change the way how they behave for the benefit of everyone. And I would say that governments are there to also think big. And uh, sometimes, and it's not just to respond to immediate concerns and immediate crisis or what is requested from them at this point. They also need to be forward looking I guess that's, that's what we call leadership or statesmanship or something, when you can rise above the immediate situation and look, look, uh, look at the bigger picture. So in that sense, uh, it's important to, to, uh, to also, we talk about innovation, we also need to, think, need to think about innovative policies in a way, and of course to see that they are, that they are implemented. One important point is that you really, 
communicate it properly, to communicate the seriousness of the situation and to include the stakeholders uh, early on so that they are on board. When it comes to the, for example, uh, protests of Dutch farmers, one could argue that that is simply because they were, maybe they knew, maybe they were informed that, that this was coming, but it was not really properly managed. Uh, it could have been managed in a better way if they were included earlier on in these discussions, and maybe they would have been on board. It's easier said than done. Very often different group stakeholders resist, but that's up to the government to try to find a way uh, to either uh, include them and then try to, to you know, uh, establish alliances with different stakeholders or simply be decisive and go through with the, with the certain uh, policies one way or another. Uh, countries can do definitely interesting things, I mean, and uh, they can also come together. I think what is interesting, what we saw yesterday is that now we have an agreement at the EU level the, when it comes to this um, uh, taxes on, on certain companies for, um, for windfall profits on energy for fossil fuel industry and also on energy savings, namely electricity rationings. Now we need to see how will it be in terms of cap prices, but we see that these things are, that there is this possibility, there is a pot potential that the EU countries come together and do some things, interesting things together. But then other countries like, for example, Germany announced its uh, plan to invest uh, 200 billion euros to support uh, vulnerable uh, groups and certain uh, parts of its population when it comes to the energy crisis. So there can be additional tools that can be done, but then again, the question is the capacities of each country, how much they can actually invest, and not everybody can do that like Germany can, for example. But definitely governments can do a lot I don't think that they can do everything, nor should they. They really need to see, uh, to try to rely on the front runners in the industry sector and try to see if these alliances can also, you don't, just to give you an example, you have sustainable finance agenda now also very high on top of the use when it comes to the use, uh, policy making, which basically will define which activities are considered to be environmental sustainable so that private investors can channelize their investments, uh, invest in that area, so that we are clear what is green, what is not green, so it's, you, you are on a clear in that sense. This is not mandatory. Com in, you know, investment funds or banks will not have to invest there, but they're already involved and carefully listening what's going on there because one way or another, it will imp it will, the EU is steering this uh, uh, this, 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 uh, this sector towards greener investments, even if it's not mandatory. So th there are these possibilities also. So it's not just about, not just about uh, command and control, although sometimes industries actually like that also because it's clear you know what you need to do and you simply implement it if you can. But there are different sets and tools, and of course I would agree that we, we can discuss about the tools, but we can't discuss forever because we don't have a lot of time to make these changes. So uh, also, uh, I mean, we, we need to discuss, sometimes think about the trade-offs and see uh, what is the, something maybe the least worst solution because the clock is ticking and we will be paying the price of our inaction when it comes to the, to the green transition. I see, uh, Mate. Yeah, 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 it's something here uh, because uh, yeah, we, we cannot uh, debate uh, forever on, on the tools, I agree. Uh, but we have some uh, ongoing debates, uh, for example, about nuclear. And we have nuclear technology for decades, and of course it's uh, improving and it's, uh, uh, it's an innovative uh, sector, so we have new solutions day by day, year by year, and we have the fourth generation reactors right now, so it's uh, very different, right? uh, for example, the, the uh, reactors we, we use uh, decades ago. And, uh, uh, we have to, uh, for example, raise a question, uh, is it the uh, um, responsibility of the EU uh, to decide uh, is it a green energy or not? And the Commission, for example, um, just postponed this decision until the uh, end of uh, uh, the previous year. And uh, Germany tried to halt this process and uh, try to undermine, uh, for example, France or uh, Hungary's uh, effort to uh, acknowledge the nuclear as a green uh, energy source. Although we can uh, produce carbon neutral electricity, a big amount of uh, electric power with nuclear. So uh, if you raise the question, what is the responsibility, for example, 
uh, 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 the EU uh, uh, in this question, uh, we can say this debate uh, was postponed because we cannot have an agreement. But if we don't uh, want to, uh, um, you know, decide it together, but let it uh, for the uh, countries to uh, decide whether they use it or not and whether they finance it or not, and uh, not waiting for uh, an EU approval, um, it, it may be better. So I suggest to be uh, technologically neutral uh, in the, in the uh, question of searching for tools, for example. Uh, Gavin, Gavin signed me that uh, he has a remark, but, but before that I would like to uh, let Sean to answer the question. Well, I'll try not, try not to keep Gavin too, far, too long away from the microphone. Look, I, th I think the first thing that government should do is get rid of the concept of the green transition. It's intellectually incoherent. It confuses lots of different policy objectives. And because we bundle them together, we measure success or failure about whether we achieve all of them. Uh, if we talk about investing in new technologies, we should be investing in new technologies because we should be investing in new technologies. It's got nothing to do with the green transition. Um, if we're dealing with pollution, we're dealing with pollution as a public health issue for our citizens. These are things that we control, and they, we can improve the quality of life of our citizens. Uh, the danger is something like uh, carbon emissions, which we don't control. Hungary can go to zero carbon emissions. Hungary can go negative carbon emissions. Brilliant. It achieves nothing. Probably destroy your economy in the process, but you'll have achieved absolutely nothing. Unless China's going to zero emission. Unless the third world, desperate for energy, are going to go to zero emission. So you need to separate out the different areas of policy. Because the great danger is if we start driving down carbon emissions and China doesn't, we destroy our economy. And China's going to remain with a strong economy because they're not doing all the things, expensive things you need to do to reduce emissions. So where does emissions policy go, carbon emissions? It should be going into your foreign ministry, who should be trying to negotiate agreements on a global level. But be very careful about getting ahead of what the rest of the world is doing, because you're running the risk of giving a massive competitive advantage to those who don't care. Um, so that, I think, is one of the areas. I think the other area that government doesn't talk about is, well, have we lost? Have we lost the fight on carbon emissions? Is climate change already a fact? And should we instead be focusing on how we adapt to it, how we deal with it? Um, and if you're living in Bangladesh, you talk to people in Bangladesh or people in Pakistan about the need to uh, reduce carbon emissions to prevent climate change, and they just say, well, that's too late for us. We've already been flooded. Our country's already disappearing. And how do we adapt to the consequences of what we've already done? Uh, Gavin, what, what, what would you want to insert into this discussion? Yeah, no, I mean, it was just, just a, a quick comment about different energy technologies and you say about some technologies being ready and others not being ready but you know nowhere anywhere in the world has a nuclear power plant ever been built on a truly commercial basis without massive government intervention if you look at Flamanville in France it was promised to the French taxpayer on the basis that it was going to deliver electricity cheaper than natural gas you know that's long flown out the window I think in the UK if you look at Hinkley Point they talked about delivering electricity at a fixed cost as part of that contract. And that's absolutely crippled EDF because of all of the cost overruns. And they're now talking about new models with, you know, regulated asset bases and with consumers, you know, sharing in the risk. And, and that's because there's massive risk and the price is very high. Meanwhile, you look at solar, wind, prices plummeting because of all of the learning curve effects. But I think the challenge and this was something, there was an article I wrote recently in American Affairs, um, this journal, talking about the challenge that we've got is this energy materials nexus, because for a lot of these different technologies, it's about access to the materials. China's had the forethought to secure those supply chains of materials. The war exacerbates some of those challenges because it cuts us off from certain materials where Russia is key and Ukraine is key to supply, or where there are opportunities in the future to develop um, you know, the sort of materials that come from here. So I think it, it's not simple and it's not straightforward. Um, but I think the other thing is also you mentioned jobs. And if you look at the jobs per terawatt hour, for a whole range of different technologies. The technologies in the green transition, solar, wind, 
a lot of the money is actually going into creating employment for people because it requires lots of installation and I think we shouldn't miss that opportunity. Challenges with the energy vendor in Germany but with the feed-in tariffs and stuff what they did do was create an awful lot of jobs and from that prosperity. Um, Stefan uh, signed his intention uh, for us to, yeah, to join the conversation. I already with the subscribed comment. earlier, yeah, so <laughs> but I'll, I'll be brief. So, no, but indeed, I, I think we just need to be careful uh, what uh, what signals are we sending, and also that lock-in effects that can occur if we invest in one technology rather than another. So, for example. On nuclear, I mean, definitely the solution. I mean, it, 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 it contributes to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but there are other environmental impacts and economic concerns we need to be mindful of. And then we can think about, do we talk about opening new plants, building new plants, or we uh, continue operating the existing ones, do we phase them out earlier, as Germany did? But I think we just, we shouldn't underestimate the power of uh, uh, innovation and just let's think about anything like the photovoltaics how cheap they are now 20 years ago it would have been unimaginable for someone to conceive such a low price for photovoltaics as it is today or even five years ago for example so a lot can be done in this sense uh, but I would agree also what Emmet was saying that we do need to think uh, we need to think about uh, vulnerable groups and uh, also developing countries and just think about the little guy you know and it, it needs to be part, needs to be inbuilt into, however you want to call it, our path towards uh, climate neutrality, sustainability, green transition. Huh? Uh, we need to think about it, and it needs to be part of that. I guess that's what, what is now labeled as the just transition at the EU level, but more needs to be done in terms of investments, but also in terms of reskilling our workforce, preparing them for future jobs, so we can reap the benefits of economic development uh, and new jobs, as you said, uh, Gavin. And again, like a role for policymakers to be involved. When it comes to innovation, one thing also to highlight uh, is that is we are we are already experiencing this digital transformation now, already during COVID, but before that a bit, and now afterwards, we need to bring these two agendas together. Again, what is called twin green and digital transition at EU level, and it's it's a phrase which is a you know, catchy phrase. Uh, often you can hear it in Brussels. But basically, it's like using digital for green and greening digital at the same time. Think about digital product passports that you can use to scan on a product and you see if what, are the, what is the chemical content, can you recycle, can you repair. You can use blockchain also to help uh, scale up renewable energy solutions. You can use AI, robotics, and of course, there are side effects, but you can, we, uh, for this also, we need, we need policy intervention to align these agendas while also relying on the market at the same time. So doing both in, uh, at the same time. And also uh, what Sean said, uh, we need to move on, I would say we need to move on different fronts at the same time. So we need to think still, about, I think we shouldn't give up on climate mitigation, but we need to also uh, already prepare for plan B, which is, I mean, climate adaptation as it is now and it's, uh, how it's happening tomorrow. We, we simply don't have a lot of space to maneuver, so we need to go to spread it a bit around and different solutions don't exclude one solution doesn't exclude uh, another just one disclaimer at this point uh, and i didn't want to continue i don't want to continue uh, uh, this uh, debate whether it's uh, that uh, the weather dependent renewables or the nuclear is the ultimate solution because i don't believe there is a one ultimate solution so different countries different solutions work out uh, and uh, uh, for Hungary for example we have the Poch uh, one uh, uh, power plant and it's profitable so uh, for for a country like Hungary nuclear uh, power plant uh, can uh, um, uh, work works out and uh, uh, for example, we can produce about 20% uh, of the electricity carbon neutral way, uh, mostly because of the nuclear power plant. And uh, I know it's a hypothetical question, it, it's a what if question, but what if, if we uh, would, uh, if we have uh, or had more nuclear power plants in the EU? Of course, uh, there are concerns, environmental and economical concerns, but we would be more independent in a... Uh, at least in the electricity sector. Uh, of course, we would ne uh, uh, need uh, more uranium, and it, it's another kind of dependency, uh, but uh, uh, we, we could produce it uh, uh, locally, we could uh, provide more carbon neutral electricity. Uh, for example, UK, as far as I know, produced the electricity around 30% from gas. 
and uh, uh, during the energy crisis it was a big big problem so there are different aspects and we uh, should consider uh, uh, all of them at the same time you had something to, to add uh, to yeah, the discussion. Yeah, I, I think just in the American context, I don't know of any wind or solar that's been built commercially without heavy subsidy either at this point. Um, as Warren Buffett famously said, the only reason to build a wind turbine is for the tax credit. Um, or as uh, people in uh, California have joked, they uh, only spin when the subsidies flow. Um, so I think talking about subsidies um, is sort of missing part of the economic picture because it seems like we all agree that there should be some level of government involvement and subsidy will be involved. I think for me, what I've seen in America is that the jobs haven't been there in wind and solar. And in fact, the unions have been heavily resistant to them because it tends to be non-unionized seasonal contract labor uh, that is easily liquidated and flushed away. Um, and that might be different in the European uh, environment. I don't know enough about the sector. But um, what I would like to see, uh, what I think would make sense for a just transition, I'm glad this phrase has come up, is I think the Ontario model could be part of, you know, what uh, countries commit to in their energy sector. And that was when Ontario moved its coal industry into a nuclear industry and basically decarbonized with their hydro their electricity grid. So they retained their coal workers in unionized jobs and retrained them for the nuclear plants. And that, along with the French build out in the, six, in the 70s of nuclear, is canonically one of the most successful energy sector decarbonizations the world has ever seen. Um, and it is the most successful decarbonization that has happened in North America. So maybe for every country there are geographical advantages to wind, solar, you wouldn't want to miss out on that. I wouldn't tell any country what to do. But I would say that um, from fossil to fission in the coal sector uh, seems to be a good way to retain that workforce, to maintain thermodynamic competency when it comes to running your industrial systems, um, and that we can point to uh, a successful story in which that happens. So. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I'm sorry because uh, we are heading towards the end of uh, this first discussion uh, block or panel of our discussion. And uh, we arrived uh, uh, at the moment to open uh, the floor to the questions from the audience. Uh, you, you, you touched the topic several times during our conversation. Uh, I. Uh, I think about the atomic energy, the nuclear energy source. And we, I have tremendous questions uh, about uh, nuclear energy. Uh, and if I want to uh, simplify and, and, uh, and uh, extract uh, and to get the gist of the questions, uh, people are inquiring about whether it is clean and green or not. Uh, I know that it's an ambiguous question. Uh, we know uh, here at the Climate Policy Institute that, that uh, within uh, energy policy debates, the majority of international organizations, including, for example, the International Energy Agency, the OECD, the IPCC, and so on, so all those organizations that have a reputation uh, advocate nuclear energy as, as something uh, clean and, and sorely needed in such a crisis uh, we are uh, now. But we can experience that, that uh, uh, the majority of Western European, or not the majority, but, but a significant part of uh, uh, the Western countries, uh, flagship by the Germans, are against uh, and uh, nuclear energy. So my, my question, if I want to rephrase the que questions on my tablet, is that uh, uh, nuclear, uh, does nuclear energy uh, dangerous, or what we see is just a witch hunt against uh, nuclear energy? Mate. It, it is dangerous, and it is a witch hunt. Uh, be, because, you know, uh, with great power, 
uh, come with uh, great responsibility. So, like Spider-Man's uh, <laughs> uncle said, uh, and this is the case uh, with the nuclear power. Uh, it's very uh, concentrated. It's very powerful. It's uh, it's kind of a fragile way, way to to process uh, energy because uh, there are security. Um, issues uh, uh, with that, but uh, at the same time, the environmental performance is pretty good. If you compare, for example, the uh, renewables to, to nuclear power plant, um, you need much less land to produce the same amount of energy, so you don't, don't have to transform uh, natural land, for example, to produce energy. Uh, of course, the, the nuclear waste is another topic, uh, we, we should discuss, and uh, this can be the topic of another panel discussion, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, we have some solutions, uh, uh, temporary uh, solutions, and uh, this is also, also an innovative uh, sector, so we, we are not finished with that, so we are looking for new solutions as well. So it's, it's not obligatory for everyone to answer the question, just feel free to, to make a response. Could I just, I think we get, as a result of the obsession with the green transition, we are getting confused about whether energy is clean or environmentally friendly. No energy produced is completely clean, and no energy produced is completely environmentally friendly. So we're talking about a balance between... Wind farms are not uh, emission, carbon emission free, because you have to build the windmills in the first place, and that has significant carbon emissions. So even... We don't think about that because it looks clean. We can't see any smoke coming off it. And we have this bias against energies where we can see the pollution rather than not see it. So I think in this conversation, we've got to have much more balance, understand there is no clean energy. If we really want to reduce uh, the environmental impact of energy, we have to consume less energy. And that has to become a, a key part of this. But don't get caught up on is nuclear clean or not. No, it's not clean, but nothing else is. I, I said that it's not compulsory for you to answer these questions, but I'm uh, really curious about uh, uh, your opinion, Emmett, because if I'm not mistaken, you are a pro-nuclear, and, uh, and uh, I'm curious about your opinion, Gavin, because uh, as I said, you, you are the author of many books on sustainable technology show. The floor is I'll yours. I'll go first and then you. Yeah, okay. Um, it's true, I do run a podcast called Nuclear Barbarians. So um, I would say this. Um, everything Gavin has brought up about the cost issues is real. And uh, nuclear involves a lot of engineering discipline. In the West, we've shed a lot of that, unfortunately. So we might have to look, in some cases, to the Koreans or the Japanese for help. Um, but uh, as far as the safety of nuclear, um, the, the only thing, it's only behind wind in terms of safety. It is one of the safest power sources out there. I think that the waste in nuclear is the best part of nuclear because it is stored in durable casks. It has yet to harm anybody in all of these decades of the industry running. It can potentially be used for fuel later on with fast breeder reactors. Um, whereas if we take a look at coal, it's uh, stored in the air. I don't think, I think so that's something we'd like to avoid. Um, and I also agree with what uh, Sean has had to say here, is that we're really looking for uh, what trade-offs are going to be acceptable to us, right? So perhaps if you're in a country that has to decide between tracts of land for agriculture or tracts of land for renewables, you might want to start looking at energy sources that take up less land so that you can still farm or whatever. Places that have wide open space and perhaps lots of windy spaces, this would be Iowa uh, in uh, America, where wind capacity factor is like the highest, it's like 45%. Um, you have a fair amount of open land there, just don't tell the farmers there that. Um, but uh, I think nuclear, to me, uh, offers such incredible potential because of its safety track record, because of what we can do with the waste, as I've already said, um, and because of the amount of land conservation we get out of it. For one example, in California, 
friends of mine basically recently saved the Diablo Canyon power plant from premature closure. And if you talk to the marine biologists in the Cal University system, the best place to study whales and aquaculture is in the uh, area that the plant pumps out its water. And the reason is because uh, it is undisturbed except for the plant. The plant is not hard on the land. And so you get a closer picture of undisturbed nature, literally right next to a huge piece of industry. And I think that that is what is ultimately inspiring about the vision of atomic energy for the future. OK, so I actually be inclined to agree with a lot of what you've both said, Emmett and Sean. I don't think safety is really the, the, the challenge. You know, like you say, it's a well-run, well-regulated industry. OK, you know, some stuff's kicked off in the past, but everything comes with a risk. There's nothing that we do that is risk-free. It's not the safety argument that I think is, is the one where things fall down. But I think, you know, you say look at France, and actually if you look at France at the moment, half their nuclear power stations are offline with various challenges. So it isn't necessarily as consistent and reliable, especially if infrastructure gets left to age and isn't maintained or, or replaced and all the rest of it. I think the other thing is, is the time lag. You know, if we're talking about the war, let's get back to the topic and all the rest of it. We need solutions that can be here quickly to deliver energy. Nuclear isn't something that's going to be there quickly. You know, Gordon Brown promised us that we'd be cooking our Christmas turkeys from Hinkley Point Electricity several years ago. And, you know, I'll be buggered if we're going to cook them with electricity from Hinkley Point this Christmas. And so I think, you know, if we're focusing back to the war, nuclear isn't something that's going to deliver quickly. It's also going back to the economics. But in terms of safety, you know, not much of a problem in terms of the waste problem. Look at Finland. OK, no one wants it in their backyard. But if you do a proper job, build a proper waste repository, that's all very manageable. But I don't think those are the reasons why I would necessarily say, um, you know, it's a challenge for the time being. And then, as Sean says, other technologies, they all come with a challenge. We're looking at lots of different renewable technologies at the moment and the end-of-life challenges that they um, present, you know, wind turbine blades and, and the energy that needs to be invested into making them. But it's all about doing the life cycle analysis so that we're comparing apples and apples across different technologies when we're looking at their impacts. And there's certainly a lot that we can do at the end of life of different renewables technologies to bring those key critical materials back into the supply chain and make new technologies from them. Stefan, I don't want to left you out, so... No, no just briefly, I, um, I would say, uh, yeah, besides say, security concerns, waste, uh, um, and waste and uh, economic concerns, it's also the question, where do we get the fuel from? And how do we, where do we get services to maintain these uh, uh, plants? And with that, again, we also have the same or similar situation with these dependencies from international markets that we have with critical materials or with fossil fuels, for example, when it comes to Russia and it also its legacy in developing nuclear uh, power for civilian purposes. Uh, but that being said, I, I guess I would say, I would be hesitant to phase out prematurely existing nuclear plants simply because of the climate, because of the climate, climate change and our uh, climate neutrality goals. Where that, that has happened, for example, like in Germany, I would, Again, I wouldn't say it makes sense to reverse back what is already done, but then uh, to now phase out prematurely, would I would really say it's, it's prudent, but then I would think twice when it comes to building new plants, or if that is the case, we need to really be careful and put lots of conditions, because we are sending a sort of a signal. It's creating, it takes time to build them, it creates a lock-in effect, and basically that, that in a way is reducing the, the, uh, the pressure to actually in innovate when it comes to renewables, and also to invest in energy savings and energy efficiency, renovating our buildings and so forth. So uh, in that sense, we need to be careful, but it is, I would say that one way or another, at least for, the, for a while, it is part of the solution for, for climate neutrality. Could, could I end a very quick point? What we need to bear, about, bear in mind about nuclear is it's one of the very few energy sources where the main raw material lies in countries which are friendly, thinking primarily of Australia and Namibia. Mm -hmm. No Canada. other source of energy has that guarantee for us. So that's a, another factor in its favor. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, I'm, I'm afraid we have time only for one question for, uh, from the uh, audience. As I, and uh, as I see uh, the, di the direction uh, of, of uh, the inquiries, uh, I would like to summarize uh, them in a way that uh, they, they flashes the problem that uh, however successful the European Union and the United States of America uh, is or are in, in uh, reaching the climate goals and, and reducing uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the, 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 the other parts of uh, uh, the world are, are lagging and uh, not able to, to keep the pace with the Western world and the most developed part of the world. And, uh, and uh, the questions are in, in relation with the problem that how can we force them to, to follow our e example or is it enforceable? Uh, is, is it uh, an obligation for them to follow our example or we have to uh, let them uh, go and, and leave them to do, uh, uh, to, to, do uh, to develop uh, their own energy mixes according to their own roadmap and own agenda. So what, what's your opinion? Maybe I was uh, too sophisticated or too complex, but I remember you. Well, I, I hope you, you uh, yeah. grabbed the question. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, this is, I think this is one of the real challenges over time. First of all, I don't just categorically agree with some sort of economic bullying or paternalism for developing countries. I think they should be treated as sovereign states because they are. Um, and that when we violate that, we create second and third order problems that are even worse than whatever we're trying to solve. Uh, so I think the best route forward is through uh, diplomacy and collaboration. One of the things that I think that the US should engage in is actually competing with Russia and China especially Russia, because frankly, Rosatom is the most successful in the world at building nuclear power plants abroad. But the US should get in that game for like an Atoms for Peace 2.0, where we collaborate with developing countries to help them build nuclear plants instead of all of that coal that I mentioned above. I think that that would be beneficial for all. I think that um, central station power, power that comes from uh, power plants is essential for human prosperity um, and that no one has ever done a decentralized leapfrog to date in uh, a su substantially populous area. So that is the way forward there as far as I'm concerned. Um, and uh, I also don't think that any of us can tell China what to do. <laughs> um, so they're gonna pursue their own path and that's the way it is. How we make deals outside of that uh, for America is up to us and our leadership and if Europe wants to participate in that in some degree, I'm sure that would be uh, exactly the type of global coordination that all of us could get behind um, as a path forward. Sean, sure, yes, you, you indicated your intention and, and I'm focusing on your uh, answer because, as I said, you are a former diplomat and uh, maybe you are the most professional in international relations and, and, and uh, well, necessity of collaboration. I heard the word diplomacy being mentioned and immediately my professional protectionism came up. As, this is my territory off. Um, I think the first thing to say is that we're not as successful as reducing carbon emissions as we think we are. Mm -hmm. We've just exported them to the developing countries that we now complain about their carbon emissions. Sorry, is it countable at all? Is it measurable at all with precise methods? I don't, I, I don't think it is. But, I mean, a lot of our... Man if you look at where our carbon emission reductions come from, they often come from deindustrialization, uh, which we, basically we've transferred the carbon emissions from other countries. So I think we need to be a little bit more modest about our supposed achievements. Uh, secondly, in terms of diplomacy, look, we went to the rest of the world and said impose sanctions on Russia. And the rest of the world said no. So, you know, we've got something like countries with 40% of GDP have not imposed sanctions on Russia because we tried bullying. 
um, US government went to India and tried to bully India, mm -hmm. and it didn't work. We've got to understand that, first of all, we don't necessarily have the right solutions, so we don't always know the right answer. So going to a developing country and saying, do it this way because we know how to do it, doesn't work. Secondly, we have to, as Emmett said, achieve uh, collaboration, we have to achieve partnerships. And we have to do this through a diplomacy based on interests. There's no point in having a diplomacy based on ideology or on values, because that immediately rules out collaboration with countries like China that don't, sell, don't share our values, don't share our ideology. So a successful climate diplomacy is one that's going to be looking at what are our interests, what are the interests of other countries as they perceive them, not as we perceive them, as they perceive them, and where can we find the synergies on which we can build the collaboration, build international programs. Uh, and Atoms 2.0, Atoms 2.0 may well be a way of doing it, mm -hmm. because we have to arrive with something to give as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, we can't just ask countries to make economic sacrifices for us to help undo the damage we did 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. Go in. Yeah, so I was just going to tie it back to our theme in times of war, because I think, um, I take what you're saying about atoms of peace. As I've said, I've got no concerns about nuclear safety in times of peace, but as we've seen with the Japarajir plant, you know, in times of war... If someone's going to bomb someone's wind farm or solar farm, I really couldn't care too much. But when a nuclear power station gets disconnected from the grid and is in the middle of a conflict, you know, there are all sorts of concerns there. And do we necessarily want that proliferation of having that asset distributed around in a whole bunch of different countries where potentially they could be flashpoints of the future? Is that what we want to export? Um, just uh, an analogue example. So, wells can be poisoned. So can we say that we don't need water management because people can die because of, because of poisonous uh, uh, water? So this is, the, this is an analog uh, example. Uh, yes, of course, uh, uh, um, nuclear power plants can be attacked. It's a risk. We have to manage this risk. But uh, can we say we don't need nuclear power because someone can attack the uh, power plant? Ahmed? Yeah, I mean, I would say that, um, I mean, what's happened at Zaporizhia? Like, it's there's been no radiation leaks. It's been very well handled. The IAEA was there. You know, if anything, it shows incredible leadership on the IAEA's part in how they handled that incident and uh, shows that um, unlike very long underwater gas pipelines, uh, nuclear is far safer. Um, as a nuclear engineer friend of mine said to me after the Nord Stream 1 and 2 were sabotaged, he said, can you imagine explaining to a nuclear safety expert Nord Stream 1 and 2 just from a safety and security standpoint? It would never be allowed in that industry. Um, so I think that when we talk about these things, um, you know, in America, for the walls that go around the reactor, they used to crash phantom fighter jets into them to test their structural durability. And it would always be the plane that got damaged, not the wall. So I think that the structural integrity is there. I think that um, perhaps unfortunately, North Korea has taught us that uh, you can get the bomb even without a reactor. Um, so that's a different sort of proliferation question. And that, uh, if we are worried about proliferation, then perhaps how we negotiate civilian nuclear globally is also a part of that conversation. And that is actually why I invoked Adams for Peace when I said what I said, because that was originally part of Eisenhower's view for Adams for Peace. So I think that the, I frankly think that those sorts of concerns are overblown and don't speak to the realities of the durability of nuclear plants. Um, and uh, I think that uh, I get sometimes more scared when uh, more fragile power plants get damaged because then you lose all of that power and have to replace all of it. Um, and that is quite the task. So uh, that's all I have to say about that. Just, just to pick up on that, I mean, we've seen how vulnerable power dis electricity distribution systems are to cyber attack. Mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. extremely vulnerable to cyber attack, often because you've been automating very old technology, and you've been patching it with uh, digital technologies, and it makes it very easy to penetrate. And that you can take out an entire country's power system, and it's not just inconvenience, that's people dying in hospital, it's people dying in elevators, in mm -hmm. car crashes, and so on. So I think we can over, I, I agree with Emma that there are other broader dangers out there. Mm -hmm. Um, the only other thing I want to ask, Gavin, is are you worried about the way Brexit's going? Are you worried about the security of French power stations against British attack? <laughs> <laughs> we'll just have to see how that one plays out. <laughs> Stefan, the last word. Yeah, I just would like to come back also to, to, to the initial question on the EU and other countries and, how, uh, and, and with respect to the transition. Uh, I think it's like it's definitely the EU needs to treat other countries as their as their partners, mm -hmm. but it, but it's also legitimate to try to make um, an influence, especially when it comes to certain topics that are of uh, significant importance and that concern not only the EU but the entire planet, which climate change, biodiversity, and other topics are. So it's not just about the EU, although the EU will try to, to benefit maybe exporting green technologies and so forth, but it's primarily not about the EU, it's, it, it goes beyond. So uh, I would say that it's rightful, that they, it should try to influence it, but in a, in a certain way. How different countries, how, what do they do, how, what is their exact energy mix, or what tools do they use, of course, is something that needs to be determined by them, but um, the EU can make a difference. And one example, what they are doing now, uh, what is happening at EU level is development of this uh, carbon, bo carbon border adjustment mechanism, which is basically trying to, in a way, um, introduce a sort of a, it will used to be called a fee, a tax, uh, tariff, you name it, but basically products entering the EU from other countries with uh, high carbon footprint would need to, to pay because the products produced in the EU already uh, uh, need to, uh, uh, to, to comply with these standards, so why shouldn't this be the case with third countries? And, uh, I mean, measuring carbon footprint, as you asked, is uh, easier said than done for certain products, uh, like commodities, like uh, intermediary products, cement, steel, it's easier to do that, and basically CBAM, carbon border adjustment mechanism, will apply mostly to these intermediate products, but then you can also deduce more or less what is the impact of final products that are based on these intermediate products. Now, of course, the devil is in the details, so we need to see how exactly this instrument will be developed, but this is an attempt to try to influence other countries to think about uh, lower carbon solutions and decarbonizing their systems, but also accounting for the question of competitiveness. Also, what, um, what Sean, you, you mentioned that uh, we need to stay competitive when facing other economies with lower environmental standards because otherwise they can take over the industries and they, if they don't care, that can actually have a bad, uh, ha have a negative effect also on our uh, climate and other aspirations. So, so that's one thing there also, uh, and, but also I would say that sometimes we are helping other governments with our requir requirements. It can, uh, it's not always intuitive, but you know, leaders in other countries can say, you know, we don't want to make a certain change, but you know, the EU is asking this for us, so what can we do? We need to do this because of this or that. So sometimes we are making their lives easier because states are not like, uh, you know, they are consist, they consist of smaller, centers of power, units, parts of government, stakeholders, industries, so you can help them, help themselves make certain changes, but it needs to be done in an elegant manner, of course. Can I make a very sure. quick comment yes. on that? Um, brief. I think the, the problem we've got there is the same problem that we had when we started introducing good governance criteria into our aid programs, our development programs, and we lost a lot of influence in Africa because the Chinese arrived and didn't impose them. So, bearing in mind that we're now competing at a global level for influence with countries, we run the risk of, in effect, using coercive protectionist means, uh, and other countries don't, then influence countries like China increases, and our influence declines. So I think there are dangers to that approach as well. Thank you very much. Uh, we have less than three minutes, so... I feel we have no room for another round of uh, questions from the audience, so uh, I would like to say thank you for your uh, attention and your contribution.
and I would like to say thank you, uh, gentlemen, for, for participating and, and sharing your, your fascinating ideas. Uh, thank you very much. Bye.